so Mike, for your, um, well, actually for everybody's um, sort of information, we got uh, some new faces that are on the call. So why don't we um, go around and just introduce ourselves. I'm, I'm going to call on you in the order that you are on my Zoom boxes here. So Meredith, you're first. Right. Um, I'm Meredith Martin, Deputy Director of Budget and Performance Management. Um, I will be assisting all of you with the CBOC. Um, so I'm, I'm learning as we go and excited to work with you all. We're excited to work with you too. Thanks for uh, jumping in. Let's see, uh, Joseph? I will have to change that. I go by Scott. It's my middle name. I am oh. the new budget and performance management director, Scott Tesh. I've been with the city for almost 11 years, uh, spent about six years in budget, and then was our OPA director prior to consolidating these offices together. So I'm excited to work with this group, um, and, and we'll allow the introductions to continue. Awesome. Welcome. Melissa? Hey there. My name is Melissa Vickers. Um, I don't know. What do I say about myself? Uh, I was on the <laughs> initial committee to have the bonds, uh, I guess, what was it, like elected? Is that what you would say? Um, and then, voluntold. Voluntold, yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I'm going to be busy this morning. I have um, Whimsical Women on Saturday, the craft show, so I've got a lot of sewing I have to do. So I will um, be listening and participating, but uh, you don't have to watch me sew. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Tanya. Hello, I'm Tanya Banner. I work for the budget department. Oh, well. uh, Mr. Rowe. Yeah, uh, Ben Rao, uh, one of the assistant city managers. Uh, I've been involved with the uh, Citizens Bond Oversight Committee since the, the first committee back after the uh, 2014 bond referendum. Uh, Brian? I'm Brian Heelan. I'm recently retired. I've been on this committee since its formation, have really enjoyed it, and uh, looking forward to working with all the new folks. Um, Hassani? Hey, good morning. Hassani Mitchell, Choice Neighborhoods Initiative Project Manager with the City of Winston-Salem, and I'm happy to be here today. Welcome. Brenda? Yes, am I last and least? No, no, there's two more. <laughs> I'm kidding you. Yes, I'm Brenda Diggs. I serve on, on this committee, which is, is great. This is, I guess, the latest of the city committees that I am serving on. I've served on several and um, serve across the community uh, as a community leader on different boards and try to help make a difference. Okay. Good to see Hassani. Yeah. <laughs> um, Mike? Hey, uh, I'm Mike Wakeford. Um, I'm new to this committee, um, and I am a liberal arts faculty at the UNC School of the Arts. I teach history and humanities there. I've also um, been working for the last uh, couple of years, uh, or a few more than that, actually, as uh, executive director of Muse Winston-Salem, a local history museum. We're in the process of, uh, of uh, planning a renovation and reopening 226 South Liberty Street in the old federal bankruptcy court building. Welcome, glad you're here. And uh, Larry, you're the last one on the boxes. Sure, he's he's um, just streaming. He's just, for, just for the IT purpose. Gotcha. Yes, um, and, I, and I'm Mark Dunnigan. Um, I'm, I chair the committee. I've been involved with this sort of grouping of committees since we did the um, the advocacy and. Um, sort of setting the capital needs. Uh, so this is sort of the third round of making sure that the bonds are a success for the city. Um, and then Gail Anderson, who is, I think her husband was having surgery, which is why she's not with us uh, today. Gail serves as the vice chair uh, of the committee. And uh, are there, is there any other committee member, Meredith, that's not on? Um, I not that I, I know of. Oh, I'm sorry, Brenda. I saw Mabel Stevenson earlier. Oh, yeah. She was on earlier. Yeah. I don't know what happened. Maybe she'll be back to join us here in a second. And then Mabel Stevenson is, is one of the others that is on our committee. Um, okay. So let, let's sort of get rolling with this. Um, I'm going to start by reading the virtual meeting statement. So, um, 
Uh, good morning. Uh, all members of the Citizens Bond Oversight Committee are participating virtually today. Uh, for all virtual meetings, the committee members will be muted until asked to be heard. And at that time, they'll be recognized and will be unmuted. Uh, when there's a vote, it will be necessary to take a roll call vote. And a committee member will be recognized, uh, raise their hand, and state their vote. Uh, today's meeting is a public meeting, and per the notice uh, that was published, uh, citizens can listen into the meeting if, if they've contacted the city manager's office to make the necessary arrangements for that. And there will be a recording of today's meeting available on um, the city's website, uh, www.cityofws.org. So with that, um, let's jump into the meat of the um, the meeting, I guess we'll have to do a roll call. We've kind of gone around, but to do a formal roll call, Meredith, could you do that? Yes, sir. Um, Mark Dunnigan? Here. Gail Anderson? Brenda Diggs? Here. Brian Hewen? Here. Mabel Stevenson? Melissa Vickers? Here. Michael Wakeford? Here. Bill Hayes? and Paul Ford. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, uh, first order of business is to approve the minutes uh, from the September 22nd meeting. Uh, those were sent out to everyone uh, by email. Uh, so does anyone have any um, corrections that they would like to have made to those particular meeting minutes? No. No. Okay, so can I um, have a motion to approve? A motion to approve. Second that motion. Okay, motioned and seconded. All in favor, um, please indicate by saying aye. 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 The mayor, do we need a formal roll call on this one? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, sorry. That's I, was right. I, was in, I was thinking I was in person again. Uh, could you please <laughs> call the roll? Uh, Mark Dunnigan? Aye. Gail Anderson? Brenda Diggs? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Brian Heelan? Aye. Uh, Mabel Stevenson has rejoined us. Mabel, you're muted. And Mabel, you're muted. Oh, there you are. All right. Couldn't get sound on the other one. <laughs> there we go. So we're, we, are, we're, we are doing a uh, vote to approve the minutes from the September 22nd meeting. Um, if, if you're in favor of that, um, please let us know by just saying aye. Aye. And then we'll, we'll reflect the minutes to indicate that you're, you're here also. So thank you for being with us. Yes, sir. Uh, Melissa Vickers? Aye. Michael Wafer? Aye. Uh, Bill Hayes and Paul Ford. Okay. okay. All right, so uh, with that being done, let's jump into the project updates, and we'll start with uh, the Choice Neighborhood Initiative. So I guess, uh, Hassani, that you, will you be taking that one? Yes, I will. Wonderful. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, once again, I'm Hassani Mitchell, Choice Neighborhoods Initiative Project Manager for the City of Winston-Salem, and I work out of community development. Uh, I'm a part of an implement an implementation team uh, for the Choice Neighborhoods Initiative. So I've prepared a, a very quick PowerPoint uh, just to go over the status of the project and then also give you an update. Obviously, this is the, the Bond Oversight Committee, and so there's some bond funds attached to this project and some commitments uh, from that area. So I'll give you an overview of the project and where we are to date. So I'm gonna share my screen here. All right, make this a little bigger. All right, give me one second here, I'm sorry. All right, can everyone see that? Yes. All right, we're good. All right, so the Choice Neighborhoods Initiative, what is the Choice Neighborhoods Initiative? And the acronym is CNI. So in April of 2020, the Housing Authority of Winston-Salem and the City of Winston-Salem received a $30 million Choice Neighborhoods Initiative implementation grant from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. So the Housing Authority and the City of Winston-Salem are co-grantees uh, for the CNI grant. 
uh, you're looking at an actual map of the project area. So the area in light purple is the actual Choice Neighborhoods Initiative project area. This area runs from 25th Street on the north, 3rd Street to the south, uh, Patterson Avenue to the west, and then on the east, there's Jackson Avenue, Dunleaf, Fowl Street, and a portion of Cleveland Avenue. So everything in, in the purple, the light purple, is the Choice Neighborhoods Initiative project area. And so the project team has developed a five-phase housing plan. And what that housing plan is going to do is bring 406 units of new housing to this community. The focus area is uh, the Cleveland Avenue homes, the current site. Uh, and then there's also the old Brown School Elementary site. Uh, so in conjunction with these two sites, uh, it's a total of 406 units of new housing, which includes 45 voucher units and construction of phase one, uh, which is the small box uh, at the bottom, the Brown School Elementary site, construction of phase one is scheduled to start uh, first quarter of 2022. So this is the actual Choice Neighborhoods area. I wanted to show uh, the proximity to downtown Winston-Salem. So it's a portion of this does include a small pocket of innovation quarter. And so you're looking at a map of the area. All right, just to take it a step further, the Choice Neighborhoods Initiative Program, it's, it's designed to leverage significant public and private dollars. And of course, the, 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 the funding comes from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. So it leverages grant funds uh, as well as private dollars to address struggling neighborhoods, um, distressed public housing through a comprehensive approach. And the three core goals include the housing, there's a people component, and then there is also a neighborhood component. And so the city of Winston-Salem, uh, our concentration is the actual neighborhood, uh, but I will go into the, the three different components, the implementation team, and who's responsible for what. But the three core goals of the Choice Neighborhoods Initiative is obviously uh, housing, people, and then the neighborhood as a whole. What you're looking at is the actual implementation team. As I stated earlier, uh, the Housing Authority of Winston-Salem is the lead applicant. The city of Winston-Salem, we are the co-applicant. And the Housing Authority uh, is responsible for galvanizing the resident leaders uh, in, in the actual neighborhood, Cleveland Avenue homes. Uh, they also provide oversight for the Citizens Advisory Committee. And so throughout the life of this project, uh, there is a Citizens Advisory Committee that is designated to provide <laughs> oversight uh, and also provide recommendations as we move along the phases of the project. Um, urban Strategies is responsible for the people implementation and Urban Strategies is actually located, uh, they're a national nonprofit organization that's located inside of Cleveland Avenue homes right now. And they are actually doing a lot of the people, uh, case management, connecting the residents with employment opportunities, education opportunities, uh, but they are also responsible for the, the relocation strategy. And then we have the developer, which is McCormick Baron Salazar, and they are a national developer. And of course they handle all of the, the development. And then Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools, they are the principal education partner. Uh, and so uh, having the school at the table is very important. And I'll also talk about uh, the new Ashley Elementary School and how that's tied into the project as well. But this is the implementation team for the Choice Neighborhoods Initiative. What you're looking at is just another shot of the actual project area. Uh, as you can see, it, it is a fairly large area. Um, you have Third Street uh, to the to the left. Uh, I'm sorry. You have Third Street to the left. You have 25th Street to the right, and then those two purple boxes uh, in the middle of this map. The larger box is the current uh, Cleveland Avenue homes, which is going to be phases two through five. Uh, it will be demolished and then rebuilt. And then the small box in the center is the current Brown Elementary School site. Uh, but I wanted to show you uh, the actual project map from, from over, overhead. You can take a look and see there's Highway 52 uh, that runs across it. We have Cleveland Avenue, Liberty Street, 14th Street. Uh, so it covers a fairly uh, decent portion. Uh, it is in between the East Ward and the Northeast Ward. So this is just an overhead shot 
of the actual project area. So just to provide a little bit more context on the neighborhood, because the city of Winston-Salem, our responsibility is the neighborhood. So the Choice Neighborhoods Initiative, it does include Cleveland Avenue Homes. It is home to the Kennedy Learning Center and also the Winston-Salem Forsyth County School Career Center. Uh, it does include Wake Forest Innovation Quarter. This project area is the future home of the new Ashley Elementary School. Uh, therefore, Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools, they're that education partner. This project area, it does contain two parks currently. It contains Fairview Park, and it also contains Bloom Park. And the project area, it, it does contain a mixture of aging single family homes as well. Uh, and many of these homes are rental properties. So there are uh, some assets in the community currently uh, that we are looking to build upon. I wanted to give a breakdown of the actual Choice Neighborhoods Initiative grant. Um, as I stated earlier, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development um, has, has granted $30 million for this project. Um, this gives a breakdown. 21 million is designated to the actual housing development. Uh, 4.5 million is designated towards supportive services. And those supportive services are managed by urban strategies. And that includes the workforce development, the community programming, uh, connecting the residents with opportunities for them to actually grow. And then there's another 4.5 million for critical community improvements uh, that, that, that need to take place in the neighborhood. So that's a breakdown of the actual grant. This is a breakdown of uh, city commitments. And out of the 2018 general obligation bonds, 3 million has been committed to the Choice Neighborhoods Initiative. To date, out of that $3,168,157 has been expended, and that has gone towards pre-award costs, um, expenses. Um, there were certain costs during the actual uh, application phase. <clears throat> so to date, uh, out of the $3 million from the 2018 bonds, uh, a little bit over $168,000 has been spent to date. $3 million dollars of CDBG, and that's the Community Development Block Grant funding, has been also allocated towards this project. And to date, uh, $197,897 has been expended towards the project. And the CDBG funds to date have been used for developer environmental services, consulting fees, um, soil assessments, uh, services related to getting the phase one site uh, ready for development. And then there's also some Liberty Street redevelopment funding uh, that's also been allocated towards the project. And I did wanna note that the commitments for this project, they, they're actually spread over the, 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 term, the, the life of the grant, uh, but I wanted to give a breakdown of uh, some of the additional funding that's been put with that $30 million, uh, just to give you a, a shot of the, the, the capital stack for this project. Other city commitments, um, these are other city funds that were included in the grant application uh, to, to show leverage and just to receive additional points during the scoring. Um, there is some allocation from the, the 2018 bonds, uh, the East End Plan. There's some Northeast and East Ward infrastructure funding that's been allocated towards this project as well. And as I stated earlier, the project area, it is kind of split between the East Ward and the Northeast Ward. Uh, and that infrastructure could include sidewalks, streets, uh, things of that nature. Uh, and then of course, uh, the $2.5 million for Liberty Street redevelopment. Liberty Street, uh, the, the area of Liberty Street from 12th Street right up to about New Hope Lane, uh, it does run directly through this project area. Uh, so there's been some funding allocated towards that as well. So I've given you a shot of the capital. I've given you a shot of the funding. So what are the outcomes? So through investments catalyzed by the grant, uh, the redeveloped Cleveland Avenue homes and the surrounding neighborhood, they should enjoy uh, high quality residential choices. Um, there needs to be improved amenities. 
these grant funds and these dollars are used as a catalyst to really spark uh, economic investment in this neighborhood. Um, effective public schools, as I stated, uh, Winston-Salem Forsyth County Schools, they are the education partner and there is a new school, the Ashley Elementary, that's planned for this neighborhood. And then of course, public safety uh, is, is also a component of this project. Uh, so we are working with our public safety department to implement an effective public safety strategy in this neighborhood that's gonna complement the new housing and also complement the development around that housing. Wanted to give you a, a look at the phases of this project. So there are five phases. Currently, we are in phase one, which is the Brown School Elementary site. And that is the actual site at the bottom. Phases uh, two through five are the actual Cleveland Avenue homes, the current Cleveland Avenue homes site. And so phase one is scheduled to begin construction in Q1 of 2022. And then phases two through five will begin thereafter. But uh, just wanted to give you an overhead shot of those phases. This is an artist rendering of the actual neighborhood. Um, it may not look exactly like that, but this is just a rendering. Uh, it is a mixture of uh, multifamily units, two-story, uh, three-story townhomes. Uh, so it is a mixture of uh, multifamily units. And also there is a senior, there is a senior unit, a senior center uh, that's included in phases two through five, and that will be on the current Cleveland Avenue home site. Asani, can you explain to me, you referenced earlier voucher, a voucher, 45 voucher residences, exactly what does that mean? Yeah, absolutely. So currently, th this is a this is a uh, a housing authority site right now, and so the the actual housing development will include uh, workforce development. It'll it'll include market rate housing, but it'll also include uh, residents that receive vouchers or additional support uh, to pay to pay for their rent. So that's that's essentially what a voucher is. Okay. So this, it does not guarantee that the current residents will be offered a new, a new place to live, does it? So in, inside of the redevelopment plan and inside of the relocation plan, every, every current resident of Cleveland Avenue homes, if, if you are a current resident that's on the lease currently uh, during this redevelopment phase, every resident, um, has the option to return. So if you if you currently live in Cleveland Avenue homes and you're a part of this five phase process, um, you do have the first option to return. Or if you choose not to return, uh, Urban Strategies, the the people partner, they're tasked with actually relocation uh, and finding supplemental housing for the current residents. And what's the degree the degree of difficulty to find temporary housing when you start this? I mean, and when it because Typically, I'm not sure where do they go. That, that's a very good question. That's a very good question. Um, our partners, Urban Strategies, they've been working with the residents uh, to actually find them housing because essentially the, the process doesn't include tearing it all down and, and displacing you know hundreds of people. There's, there's no way that could happen. So Urban Strategies is working with the families really in phases. Uh, as they tear down the building, as we get prepared for phase one, uh, to find them housing throughout the city. Um, so, you know, it, it is a challenge. Um, it is a challenge. I think Urban Strategies is probably better equipped uh, to talk about the relocation of the current residents, but they are actually doing their best to ensure that everyone that's currently living in phases one through five has somewhere to go. And then if those residents choose to return, um, you know, there'll be adequate space for them to return. Do we know the, if there will be an increase in the rent that they pay? If you are, if you are a current resident and what you are paying now, um, there should not be any changes to, to the new, to, to what you're paying when you, when you, when you actually fall into your new phase. But like I said, the housing authority and also, uh, urban strategies, they are actually, handling the housing piece and the relocation piece. Um, and so they're, they're really better equipped uh, to really answer those housing and relocation questions. And Bonnie, can you, I think one of the ways that um, 
they're handling some of that is phase one. There, there is not currently housing on phase one, the site right. that's the Brown school site. Right. And so once that is constructed, that'll give them some, I'm gonna call it swing space. That's probably the wrong term, right? but that's right. what it'll give them. It'll give them some uh, flexibility with the what's there. Yeah, absolutely. There, there's not current housing on phase one. So, you know, that gives the residents that are in the current Cleveland Avenue home space to actually locate to phase one. So, so there'll always be more like an overflow of, of, of active space. Uh, whereas you're not just displacing people with nowhere to go. I think there's another project that is slated to start 2022 with housing, and that is, and I'm sure you're aware of the, the United Metropolitan, the Third Street, Fifth Street, all of those apartments there that are now pretty much boarded up from what we know, that's gonna be a housing. Is it, are y'all aware of that? We are aware that particular project, although it is in the Choice Neighborhoods project area, right. um, it, it, it is not directly affiliated with, with this redevelopment project. Yeah, but what's the impact? Or, and maybe you don't know that right now because all of those residents had to be relocated. I do not know the, the impact, unfortunately. I, I do not know what that impact is on, on those residents that lived in that housing unit. And my last uh, observation is you've covered housing and you've covered education, but we still have a need for um, a grocery store and that kind of retail side. Is there anything in the plans to bring that? I mean, that, that still remains an issue in this particular section of our community. Sure. I'm going to continue on. I have a few more slides that may address uh, some more of the questions, but I'll continue on and actually touch on, on that if you don't mind. Okay, great. Excellent. All right, sure. Uh, I did want to give you a shot of the unit mix uh, for phases one through five. Uh, like I said, there is a mix from one bedroom to five bedroom. There's a total of 406 units that will be included in this housing uh, redevelopment project. And as I stated earlier, phase one is the Brown School Elementary site. The people, so this gives you uh, just a snapshot of the current residents. And this is the current residents in Cleveland Avenue homes because they are the focus of the actual housing redevelopment. Um, as you can see by the data, uh, the current residents, they are primarily African-American. Uh, they are primarily female. And the ages of the residents can range anywhere from five years old to, to 65 years old. But there are 220 households that are currently in Cleveland Avenue homes. Uh, and that is roughly about 506 residents. But this is the target population demographics of the current residents inside of Cleveland Avenue homes. Now, I did wanna just kind of emphasize the city, the city of Winston-Salem, we are responsible for the population and the residents outside of Cleveland Avenue homes. So our target is the neighborhood outside of Cleveland Avenue homes. But this is the population that, that Urban Strategies is currently working with currently. The people strategy, as I stated earlier, outside of the, re the relocation, um, Urban Strategies is tasked with ensuring that the current, re the current residents are connected with education resources, uh, economic mobility resources, health and wellness. So they're connected with a plethora of organizations within the city. Um, every household uh, has a case manager and there are active cases uh, on all of the households within the community. Because the idea with the Choice Neighborhoods Initiative is it's more than just uh, tearing down uh, a distressed housing unit and rebuilding it. You do want uh, some mobility with the residents should they choose to return. Um, and then touching on some of those needs that are in the community, the city of Winston-Salem, we have done uh, community engagement, uh, resident assessments, and things of that nature to determine what are those improvements that need to be made uh, in the neighborhood. And we know uh, it, there is, it is a food desert. We do know there are certain uh, economic resources that are lacking in the neighborhood. We are tasked with leveraging these grant dollars to do specific, uh, specific improvements. They have to be physical, tangible improvements that are really gonna catalyze uh, future investment 
uh, to come into this neighborhood. And so HUD has kind of give us, given us some guidelines on things we can do <clears throat> and things that we cannot do. Uh, HUD has to approve uh, what those actual catalytic projects will be. Uh, so to answer your question, Ms. Diggs, a lot of, a lot of residents have expressed um, you know, healthy food, uh, grocery stores, uh, retail, you know, things of that nature. But our plan and our strategy, it, it, it has to be approved by HUD. So HUD really has to approve what we can do, what we cannot do. Uh, but we are aware of all of those needs that are actually affecting the Cleveland Avenue Homes community. And so everything, everything won't be done within the grant period because it's a six-year grant. So we have to actually expend these funds within six years. But we hope the projects that the city does do uh, kind of lay a foundation for those needs and for that investment to come into the community. Uh, this is my last slide. I did want to just give another shot of the phasing and the, the current schedule. Um, as I stated earlier, uh, construction for phase one, which is the old Brown School Elementary site, that's scheduled to commence in the spring of 2022. Uh, and those units should be available for lease by the summer of 2023. And then the image uh, just gives you a, another shot of the actual five phases, how many units will be in those phases and how many buildings are currently uh, going up in those phases. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And if anyone has any questions or concerns, I'm happy to field those. Asani, I just had a question back to one of the early slides, uh, just a term that I, I don't know. Um, you, you mentioned, you explained the voucher um, the voucher properties. There was a, also, some of these would be workforce um, housing or workforce, um, for workforce, what, is, what does that mean as, a, as, as opposed to market rate properties? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, the idea behind the Choice Neighborhoods Initiative is, you know, we, we want the neighborhood to have a blend of just workforce, meaning there's certain housing that's designated for uh, employers, it's designated for individuals uh, that, that qualify under certain programs if they work for certain employers or if they're coming into the city. Um, vouchers, obviously, uh, if you are low income and you need, you know, subsidies or assistance with your actual, your, your rent and then market rate is just essentially that it's, it's market rate. What, what, what you would pay without any kind of type of assistance. So, uh, so workforce could include vouchers or, or cause I, cause it, it was listed as three different things. I'm just trying to figure out the difference between workforce and market rate. I think of most workforce folks is having to compete on the private market for housing. It, it, there's a dollar amount, Mike, that is okay. um, like a monthly rent amount that qualifies housing units to be called designated as workforce okay. um, also. And, and it's, it's typically a little bit less than what a market rate apartment might go for in, in the area. Um, but, but I've seen on a lot of projects recently that there are workforce housing units, uh, you know, sprinkled in with market rate in a sort of overall development. Okay. And, and uh, Hassani, is it, is it, what is it? 80% to 120% of area median income? It's, it's 80%. Yeah. It's 80% of the area median income. But having a voucher does not mean that you don't work. Is that correct? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Have, and, and I'm happy you asked that question. You know, yeah, having that's a voucher. Getting to Mike's point, too, because you understand even a voucher, you know, you may be part of the workforce with a voucher. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Having a voucher does not mean that you, you don't work. Um, you may fall into certain income limits, you know, that qualify you for that voucher. Yeah. Right. Because typically, as if when you look at the demographics of who has been living in that area, it's single mothers who work, but their wage is not going to be enough for them to take care of everything. So they have a job and a right. voucher. Right, right. And and one of the things that uh, Urban Strategies, the, the people partner, you know, one of their goals is increasing the average wages of the residents, making sure they're connected with employment opportunities. They actually track um, every quarter, you know, who, who, has, who has received the job, what those wages are. Um, so they're actually tracking all of that from start to finish on the project. And I know that the city's position is not to advocate necessarily 
for the retail side, i.e. to help with the food desert situation. But I do think that we have to continue, all of us, uh, to push for that because you can bring in a new housing development, but you still have a major component that is missing. And until we continuously push on something that's been an issue for years, it's not going to change. You know, we've got more, you drive there now, you have more fast food uh, restaurants than you do wholesome food restaurants and that kind of thing, or grocery stores, rather. So we still have to, I think, with, with the new, and even with Innovation Quarter, as I like to say, they've crossed the railroad track. There is the commitment that we have to have because they've crossed the railroad track coming east of town that we need to make sure that the right things happen. And I'm, we, the committee, can't, but we as citizens and individuals can. Asani, getting back to something Brenda talked about earlier, and not a lot of detail, but when it looks like the phases all plus or minus have about 80, 80 units in them. So is the plan as one phase is done is when the demolition of the next phase begins so that there really theoretically should be very few people who are displaced with the no options of somewhere to go? Is that is that correct? Well, the plan is, so once we start phase one, phase two should begin before phase one is over. You know, so they're not going to start each phase once one phase is over. They'll be running simultaneously. Um, so as, as several buildings are go, go down, those residents have been relocated. And then as the buildings go up, those residents can move into the buildings in the prior phase. Okay. So there's probably a little bit greater chance then for displacement than what I was theoretically thinking. Right, right. And, 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 and like I said, from, from an oversight standpoint with the Choice Neighborhoods grant and its federal dollars, you know, HUD is really not going to, they're really not going to allow any, any type of displacement for the residents. Right. Well, there, how, how will it be determined that new residents, residents who are not a part of uh, 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 already in, 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 you know, in one of the apartments, and you have new apartments. So how will it be determined that new people, new residents can go into the new buildings, the new apartments? You know, let's say you have 100 apartments, new apartments, and you have a, a hundred uh, apartments, old old apartments, but you have 20 new people who want to go into the new apartments. You follow me? I think I follow you, and and that's that's probably more of a, of a housing authority question, but I'll, I'll do my best to answer it the best that I can. You know, currently we know there are current residents who live in Cleveland Avenue homes who will not relocate back into these current homes. You know, they've, they've already expressed <clears throat> they want to live somewhere else, right? Um, there are a percentage of residents who live in Cleveland Avenue homes that will return. Um, so in theory, there will be room if you, if you don't live there currently and you want to live there, right? In theory, there should be adequate room for you to live there, should you choose to, if you don't currently live there. Um, but there is, a, there is a percentage of folks who will not return. There is a percentage of folks who don't want to return. And then there's a percentage of folks who will return. Um, so if there's someone who does not currently live in Cleveland Avenue homes throughout this five-phase process, um, there should be opportunity for them to move uh, into one of the phases. And Mark and Meredith, Ben, maybe you guys can help me. I've been kind of just looking at this at our flash um, uh, stoplight report, rather. I mean, I, see, I saw, if you go back to one of the screens, I saw like the Southeast Ward, you know, some of those monies. But the monies that Hassani is managing from the bond, is it on our stoplight report? Some, some of them are. Um, there's, there is some 2018 bond money that is on there. I think it was $3 million, if I remember right. The Southeast uh, Eco Ward Economic Development, is that the line? It's it's within the, um, let me pull my report here. I, have I guess my question is, are there any monies that aren't on the stoplight report? So 
the CDBG funds that he was talking about, that Hassani was discussing, are, are not on the stoplight report. The three million that is um, included in the CNI is within the neighborhood revitalization um, item, which is about the fifth from the top of the stoplight report. The it's 10 million. That, it's within that 10 million. Um, okay. And those funds were actually within the last two months um, allocated into the CNI project. Okay. Um, the other kind of bond projects that Hassani mentioned that were included in the application were to gain points showing that the city is investing in those communities through other avenues and projects, not just CNI. Okay. Project. Yeah, in, in, in my view, Hassani, I think this is a, just a fantastic program. I mean, it is taking, it, it is it is leveraging the dollars that the city is able to spend here to their highest and best use. I mean, there, there is no way, there's no other way we would be able to do this amount with that amount of money than what you're doing right now. So we appreciate all that your office is doing to make this happen because you're a big part of it. Well, thank you. Um, and I think one thing that I also failed to mention is as a part of that leverage, um, there are partners who have committed um, outside of the city commitment. You know, there are partners uh, who have committed uh, other leverage uh, in the neighborhood. Um, and a part of the city's goal is to really use the funds to leverage other funding and to, to leverage other partners as well. You know, HUD really wants to see uh, how we leverage those funds to bring as many resources uh, as we can into the neighborhood. I think we've had a, a great overview of how much of this is being shared in that community or other connecting communities, because I'm not certain everybody understands how important this is. And I don't think everybody ever will. Is, is that a, was that a question? Well, I mean, I just think it's, you, you have enough great information. How do we how do we share this? That's that's a very good question. Uh, we do have a a website um, that's actually it, it's it's a it's a project website. Really, it's not a full blown uh, uh, URL, if you will. It's actually a, a website that we share with the residents and and the community at large. Um, I'm happy to actually share that with the committee. It will give you timelines. It will give you drawings, elevations of what the uh, what the five phases will look like. Um, there is also a minority business component because it's federal dollars. Um, so there will be contracting opportunities, uh, employment opportunities uh, for local residents internally uh, and in the neighborhood if they want to actually work on this project. Um, as far as the, the city's role in the neighborhood strategy, uh, we do have that citizens advisory uh, steering committee, which is comprised of residents. Uh, it's also comprised of uh, you know individuals and leaders in the community as well. So they provide oversight. Um, I think as we move along, because you know 2021 has really been a, a planning year. Um, it's been a planning year with the developer and making sure all the funding is there. Uh, there's there's a lot that has been going on in the background. Uh, during 2021. So as this rolls out for construction in phase one, it, it will be a lot more visible. You know, it will be a lot more visible, but this year has really been a planning year um, and, and a lot of engagement internally with, with residents and, and stakeholders. Right. Is Durban Strategies in charge of communication or is, is there someone who is in charge of communication? But this, this, how, the housing authority in the city, we are co-grantees. So it's really a, uh, I would say it's a collaborative effort. Everyone has their own part, like the housing, the neighborhood, the people, and that comprises the entire team. Um, and so I, I do understand, you know, if folks in the neighborhood may feel that they're asked, because it's such a large project and there are a lot of moving parts um, where folks have a lot of questions. You know, they do have a lot of questions and it's primarily centered around the housing and it is primarily centered around relocation. Um, and so collectively as a team, the implementation team, you know, we're tasked with really disseminating information to our various components uh, of the project. I think something like this, you know, you take it to the people, you take it, I mean, and there are several large <laughs> churches around in that area. The other one, I don't know, even a presentation to the minister's conference because there's going to be somebody that's going to, once it starts, really 
that's going to get the, get all out of whack about it. And I think the more you can get ahead of it, and, and I know this because that's the way it happens in our community. So I think, you know, if there are opportunities to share and have uh, people out there that are advocates for, as opposed to raising issues. Well, the, the interesting thing about phase one, Brenda, so it, where that is, it's next yeah. to the career center, right? Yeah. So everybody in Forsyth County, that parent, That's student, 52. teacher, you know, yeah, and right on right on 52. Yeah, I don't know if you'll be able to see it from 52, but it's right there at it. I mean, they're well, all going to see it when they come on the campus. Yeah, but they don't live there. They see right. it. But, and right. that's so what I'm saying is it's going to be visible. It's going to be a very visible yeah. phase one. Yeah, it's not the people who come out, come there. It's the people that live there. And it's right across from uh, Senator Lowe's church, Shallow. Great opportunity to <laughs> spread the word. Yeah. So I, I completely agree. I guess one last thought is, um, you know, we, we want to make sure that, to, to your point, Ms. Ms. Diggs, we want to make sure that we are engaging the residents and the folks that live in that project area. Um, because although we are engaging partners outside of the project area, you know, the, the development and the, the, the economic development and the catalyst, these funds are really directed for that community. Right. Um, and so as, as we move along, you know, we want to be intentional that the folks that live there, uh, not only in Cleveland Avenue homes, but the folks that live in that, in that map, area then then they are the focus right which is why communications is so important <clears throat> okay thank any you. other questions for asani no thank you asani that was a great presentation great and thank, thank you. you for all you're doing we look forward for a uh, for an update here in the in the, one of the coming meetings uh, but thank you again for everything that you and your your team is doing all right thank you okay um Let's see, let's jump to the stoplight report. And Meredith, did you have that um, able to pull it up? I do. All right. Can everyone see that? Yes. Perfect. All right. Um, so just to go through, um, some of the new projects that are kind of within the larger buckets um, that have occurred in the last couple months. Um, first off, the Sani obviously hit the choice neighborhoods that's within the neighborhood revitalization, 10 million. Um, and so that's, that's one new project. Um, as far as another new project that has come up is within the East Ward neighborhood revitalization, and that's um, Rams Point, which is going to be a three-story mixed-use facility um, off of Martin Luther King between Third and Fourth Street, um, so that's that's going to be that's a new project that um, has some funds allocated out of that 1.7 um, million. Um, in the public safety area, um, council did some shifting of funds, and so um, what was originally budgeted um, from the general fund, the C crime prevention plan has now been funded through ARPA. And so um, additional funds have been found for the fire stations. And so for fire station number three, an additional 1.1 million was added to the budget. Um, so it's it's now, um, it's, it's out to bid again, and hopefully the bids come in a little more um, respectable so that we can, um, we've done some value engineering there as well. Um, but that's where we stand with Fire Station 3. And then Fire Station 13 also received $150,000 in additional budget um, to finalize, to finish that project. And it's still on schedule for um, June of next year to be completed. Um, within the Parks and Recreation uh, bond order, um, some notes to highlight. Um, several of the projects will hopefully be completed within November. Um, including the playgrounds, um, Bethania Rural Hall, Rural Hall Park. Um, and then it's also noted that Winston Lake Park, um, the construction will potentially be completed in November. Um, so that, that's what's going on there. Um, Carl Russell has been added to the list um, 
that needed explanations. It's become delayed due to the gym floor installation. There were some issues there with humidity within the gym, which was calling causing problems with the floor installation. And so um, our recreation department has been working with property and facilities management um, to improve that situation. Um, a, a contract has been set, a PO set, um, to resolve that issue so that we can continue moving forward. And once um, the gym floor is really the, the final piece of that original scope um, to finish with Carl Russell. So Mary, um, is the kitchen renovation, all that other stuff is complete? Yes, that's my understanding. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. And the furniture has been arriving as well. So, so it's, it's primarily the gym floor at this point. Um, the final project within this um, bond order that has um, had some progress this the past couple months was is the East Down Park restrooms. Um, that construction contract was awarded. Um, if if you look over, there are um, in the MWBE area um, some a good faith effort was made um, for MWBE purposes. Um, but that that project is now in the construction phase, um, and hopefully we'll we'll get going here, and we'll get a completion date um, ASAP. So that's where we stand. Um, as far as um, the streets projects, um, the second contract for street resurfacing is out, and um, hopefully will be completed um, prior to um, the asphalt plants closing for the winter. Um, and everything else is still primarily in the design phase. Um, so that, that's kind of where we stand with the stoplight report. Mayor, were there any other, um, a lot of the schedule items have been read for, for a couple of months because of the delays with COVID and some other things like that. Were there any other big schedule items that turned red since our last call? No, no, sir. Just um, really just Carl Russell due to the gym floor. Everything else is, is has been pretty steady. Um, we have some new dates, but we just haven't progressed to changing um, fully changing the color of the stoplight report to the new color. So um, the, the other question I have with it, um, when I when I look down the construction side of the MWBE participation, there's a lot of um, the yellow, which I think means that there was a good faith effort made, and but it didn't meet the original goal, and um, and and that that that's all fine and, and good. And I wonder, you know, is there something that we can learn from that? Are we setting the goals appropriately? If if um, it's becoming increasingly difficult to hit them, you know, and I, I don't have it. I'm in the industry and I don't, I don't know the answer to that either. So it's a, it's a hard question, but, um, just this, it's just interesting to sort of see them all in one place. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I, I can speak with our MWB office as well as our purchasing office. I know they have a list that they reach out to for every project, um, to let them know that bids are available and, um, but it, it, it is very interesting to see that because it's something I hadn't noticed until actually looking at the stoplight report. Maybe, um, you know, on one of the upcoming meetings, we could ask Shakira to, to jump on and mm -hmm. just um, kind of give us, you know, her assessment of, you know, are, are we where we should be? I mean, she may say, yes, this looks great and we're very happy with it. And I think we should all be happy with it if the, if the good faith efforts have been made and then they are hitting whatever they agree to. Right. That, that's that's really sort of from the designers or from the contractor's perspective, that's what they're attempting to do. Um, but I'd love to just get her assessment of it because she's probably got um, a much better handle on it than anybody else does. I think the other question is whether or not this is reflecting so much yellow because of the difficulties with operating in the COVID world over the last 18 months. I mean, did it look different prior to that? Because we know the struggles of, of small businesses, minority businesses in particular. So I think if we can contrast, if we can go back and look to see where were we in 20, what, 18, 19, as to where we are now. And is this difficulty due in large part because they don't have the funds or the manpower 
to necessarily compete. And, and oddly, I think another a, a potential other side of that coin, Brenda, could be, are they just that busy? Well, yeah. You know, because I, I can tell you, I mean, I don't know anybody in the construction industry that's not wide open right now. Yeah, but I think it would be worth looking back to see because it, it is disturbing to think that we have that much business and yet we can't seem to attract minority business. I'd, I'd like to ask a question more, I mean, and maybe can help Mike too since Mike's fresh on the board. These goals, I was under the impression that who's setting the goals? I mean, I didn't think the goals were negotiable. So the, the way that it works, um, the the city, the Jakira's office will, will help to set goals that are specific to each project. And then um, the, the design team that will re review their proposals, uh, the design teams will have what their anticipated percentage um, of participation would be within their contracts in it. They'll evaluate that. That's, that's a little bit simpler because um, those are um, professional services. So they, they can say, you know, if we're going to have 20%, they know they're going to have 20%, right? On the contracting side, it's, a, it's all of these projects, I think, are a bid, you know, versus a, uh, versus a proposal. So designers give you a proposal, and there's a qualifications component to that. Contractors in this scenario give you a bid. And so what the state requires is that they, there's a very prescribed system to say, we, we did these things that shows a, a good faith effort was made to maximize the participation on the project. If, if a number at the end of that bid does not uh, exceed, meet or exceed the goal, then there has to be an explanation to the city to say, this is what we did. If they say, yes, you did meet the good faith effort, um, then the city can make the determination as to whether they want to accept the bid or not. So, you know, so there, it's the, the bid process does make it a little bit challenging because it's a balance between participation and dollars, right? And so um, it's not unusual for there to be some that are low, but when I see so many of them lower than the goal, I, you know, I, I think it's just worth it's, it's worth the assessment to see if the goals are right. Let me, just, if I can, just add to that, Mark. Uh, as far as the city's process and goal setting, so as you as you mentioned, I mean, our policy for professional services, architectural engineering, is is a ten percent goal uh, going in for for construction contracts where we're bidding, whether it be for a formal bidding process. We have the Jakira's uh, office, which is part of the Office of Business Inclusion and Advancement. Um, they'll look at the project and they'll look at the trades that'll be involved uh, in the project. And based on that and, and what they know in terms of availability of local NWB vendors to, to uh, provide those trades, they'll set a goal that's reviewed by an internal NWB committee, which is a staff committee, but then that then will then go to a citizens NWB committee. So the, so the, so that's how our formal goals are set on those types of uh, on those types of projects. And then, as you noted, uh, when we you know, start the bidding process, if the low bidder, for example, lowest responsive bidder, you know, submits a bid that has uh, a, you know uh, commitments that are less than the goals, then there is a good faith effort evaluation that is done. And I think just by uh, you know, uh, just as a note, the, the points that are required to demonstrate good faith for the city is a little bit higher than I think the standard for the state, for state projects. So uh, so even with yeah. that, I mean, we have, you know, there's still a threshold that, that that contractor would have to meet to demonstrate good faith. And then at that point, as you said, I mean, if they meet good faith, and, and the recommendation is to, to send that forward, that contract forward for consideration by council, then that'll be, that'll be part of the package that the council can see, you know, sees is, is uh, you know, how did they demonstrate good faith? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and in, in most cases, my experience with what the um, Office of Inclusion has done, has, the goal setting has been good. You know, it, it's, been, it's been accurate, it's been, it's been a good process. Um, 
and, and that's why I'd, I'd like to get Dakira's take on it because I, I respect a lot what she does and how she does it because it, because it is a little bit it can be higher than what the state requires for instance but not always well we'll definitely do that we'll definitely have her come and and uh give her assessment great any, any other questions on the stoplight report mike that's the first time you've seen that um so each that that report has all of the projects that are part of the bond on it and then each month um or each every other month when we meet they'll have it uh as current as it can be for that meeting so if something uh changes we can sort of ask the question and the the idea with it was if we see something that's yellow or red you know we probably need to understand either why it is and then what are we doing to um you know moving forward and if and at the moment that everything's completed does does our committee cease to exist um yeah <laughs> <laughs> we can probably find something for you to do. We've done that twice now. Um, hey, beware what you wish for, Mike. <laughs> well, I, so I, I think um, I think this is not a standing committee, you know, like we have with other appointed boards and commissions. So I think that that once the projects are completed, you know, we probably would go through some kind of a sunset, you know, with with the committee. Um, so, but, but I mean, as, this, as the, the members know, uh, with the, uh, the, the resolution that created this committee does give the council the discretion to assign other projects, which you all have done. Uh, they, they've assigned the COVID-19 response fund grant process, the community investments review committee grant process. So uh, you never know. Thanks. Okay, um, let's jump to, um, Ben, you were going to give us an update on the COVID-19 funds. Yes, uh, I know that, that at, our, at the last meeting that I had mentioned that, you know, that some of the challenges that, um, that we're experiencing with just trying to get all the reporting submitted by agencies and trying to, to, to uh, kind of review where they are. And uh, I will share with you that that's still continuing. Uh, I, can, I can certainly share with you with some of the information that's been provided, just as kind of little highlights of what some of the agencies were able to accomplish in, during their, their term. But uh, as, as, I, as I mentioned last time, that uh, I think one of the lessons learned about this process has been you know, providing grants to smaller organizations that don't necessarily have the capacity, the administrative capacity to, uh, you know, to kind of keep track of, of, of you know, the, the spending of a, of a grant like this. I mean, even though some of the grant amounts were small, these are, these are very small organizations. And, and when you have one staff person who is the, the, the point person on providing a lot of this information, all it takes is a, an illness within that organization and then it completely, I think, uh, gets them off track. So, so we're still working with a handful of them on, on trying to get the, uh, the, 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 their final data uh, so that we can compile that and show that to you all uh, because the demographic information was a required part of their reporting. And what you'll eventually see is that for some of the organizations, they just really the nature of what it is that they were doing, uh, they weren't really tracking some of that data, but, uh, but, but we'll certainly present what they did you know, provide. So, um, so I apologize that this is still a, very much a, a work in progress. And like I said, I've, I've got some information, kind of, uh, kind of running information on a, on a PowerPoint slide I can show you all if, you, if, if you're interested to just kind of see, well, how many, you know, backpacks did for the Forsyth backpack program hand out. How many hygiene products did the Diaper Bank of North Carolina provide? I mean, there are some certain highlights like that. But um, but eventually, we are you know working towards providing you all a and the and the mayor and city council ultimately a finished report that shows the breakdown in the in the you know, in terms of the demographics, whether it's you know race gender, even zip code uh, location, that was very important to council. Uh, and then also some of the other you know, program you know, achievements that these, that these agencies um, 
accomplished. I will tell you that, it, that it, since our last meeting, there are there's at least one agency that I'm having to pursue uh, about their reporting or lack of reporting. And I'm, I'm probably at a point where I'm going to have to uh, strongly remind them that that is a requirement of the agreement and that if they don't comply, then uh, the city can request that the funds be returned. So, How big um, a grant was that, Ben? Which which one was that? The one you're just the one you're discussing right now. How big a grant was that? Oh, let, let me let's see here. Um, it was a little over forty one thousand dollars, and I mean, I'll just be I'll just let you know it's Siembra, North Carolina. Um, so. Um, so having to do some follow up, and I, and I know for some of these agencies, I mean, like, well, what in the world are you doing? You know, touching base with me now, but it's just, it's been an interesting experience with these, with, the, with this particular grant process, because you know, as you all know, back in okay. April of last year, the goal was to get that million dollars into the community as quickly as possible, and you all helped us achieve that. Uh, but even just getting the agreements in place with some of these organizations and making sure that their legal names were reflected on the agreements. I mean, it, it was, it's, there's been a lot of lessons learned that I think we're applying towards the, the uh, what we call the CERF grants, the CIRC grants that you'll hear about here in a moment, where I think we're, our process is going to be, uh, honestly, probably tighter. And, and, uh, and, and I think we'll have some, some, more reliable reporting coming out of that. Ben, was there an official deadline? So good, that's a good question, Brian. I mean, the, the the agreements were for six months. The agencies were supposed to provide, you know, uh, reports for six months. And as the, the time period progressed, a lot of them, their, 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 six, their term started at different times because of how long it was taking to get the contracts executed. So some of them started in May, right after you all had approved the grants and some of them, they didn't, they really didn't get start executed till June or maybe even July. So that is, is you know, very much staggered. Uh, but what became apparent is that some of them, they just weren't spending the money at a rate where they were gonna have it spent out by the end of the six month period. And, um, I guess, you know, some, some management discretion here. I mean, uh, rather than say, well, if you don't have to spend six months, you lose it. You know, the intent of the million dollars was to get the money into the community as quickly as possible. I think that, I think what we've learned is there's some well-meaning agencies out there. They just, you know, I think there are issues, challenges with capacity. And so, uh, kind of the informal understanding was, well, you can continue to utilize the funds beyond the six months but you have also got to continue to submit reports. So some of them submitted six six months worth of reports. They were done, and their and their and their participation was uh, you know closed out. Others, they're they're you know, you know they'll probably have submitted more than six months of reports, but that's because it's taken them longer to submit. I mean, longer for them to expend the funds. Uh, and then I did require all of them when it became apparent that the way they were reporting their information, uh, you know, just it, some of them is just unique in terms of the, the, the populations they serve, that type of thing, that for the purposes of making it hopefully easier for staff to pull this all together, I did add a requirement, which we're, which we're allowed to do under the agreement. The city can ask for other reports if necessary to give, to give us a final report on all that, on their activities over whatever period of time they took to spend the dollars, whether it was the six months formal period or whether it was the however long it took them to spend the dollars. And at the end of that point, at the end of that time, they needed to submit a final report to the city about how they spent all the dollars and all the populations. And that's that's what I'm, I'm uh, doing some follow up on right now that there's some, again, some of them are really the smaller agencies just kind of saying, hey, look, I, I need, now a summary of what all you did uh, with the grant so that we can pull together this report for you all and, and ultimately for, for the elected officials. Other than the, the singular grantee you spoke out previously, do you have concerns about any of the other grantees being able to fulfill the requirements? 
I, you know, I don't, I, I mean, literally there was one that I was looking at this morning that was the last one to, uh, to actually, we actually executed a contract with, it was Iglesia Luz de Jesus Cristo. Um, and they initially, I mean, it's a very small church, I think, I believe, you know, they initially had said, well, you know what, we're not, I'm not sure we can even do this. And, and I, I, we tried to be encouraged to know, you know, go ahead and let's, go through the process, get a contract executed. They, I think they had a change over who on their staff would actually be the point person for it, which I think was good. And uh, so it took a long time to get the, the contract with them executed. But when I was looking back you know, through uh, my communications with them, uh, they've they had some issues early in the year with staffing. Uh, here again, having an individual sick, and and uh, so they're they're going to need to do some catch up work for me. But as far as as far as any concerns that an agency hasn't utilized the funds appropriately, I don't have any uh, real concerns about that. I just I just need to 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 remind them the importance of the reporting. Okay. Any other questions on the COVID-19 grant process? All right, um, and I think Meredith, you were gonna update us on the CERC grant process. Yes, sir. I am going to share my screen. I just put together kind of a refresher based on the questions that were asked last meeting. So CERC created um, the five different categories um, for the funds. Um, which were social justice, long-term anti-poverty, broadband, heritage preservation, and mentorship. We had a total of 118 applications that were submitted, and there was a max score given of 16 points. So as stated last meeting, um, there were four agencies that um, did not take the funds um, once they were awarded. Um, and so this slide breaks down which category those specific agencies were in. Um, several of them were just unresponsive when we reached out trying to set up the contract and execute the contract. Um, youth life skills res responded back to the city saying they just, they could not um, move forward with the program with the funding that was awarded. So um, that's the feedback or lack thereof feedback um, we received in order to move forward. So. The funds that are still currently available um, total 54,350, but you can see within the categories, so social justice, there's a little over 10,000, heritage preservation, there's 19,000, and the mentorship program, um, there's about 25,000. So um, that's where we stand. I have also, um, and I can zoom in if necessary, um, this, these were all the agencies within all the categories that were funded. And then I also have um, the breakdown of the unfunded organizations that includes the combined average score that, that was provided. So as we move forward and try to figure out how we wanna move forward with these unfund, these funds that are still available, we can have that discussion. So um, I can pull this up back up, but I'll stop sharing my screen for a moment just to see if there are any questions, any discussion we wanna have. And I'm happy to pull that unfunded organizations item back up as well. I'm gonna try to unmute in between train whistle blows here behind me. Um, <laughs> the last three was once we funded. Pardon? The last screen showed all of the ones we funded. Um, Yes, ma'am, I have a list of, um, a compiled list of all the funded organizations. And then I also have a list of all the unfunded organizations. And so I know last meeting we discussed, there was discussion of, do we just go to the next agency on the list within that category um, yeah. or, or how do we wanna move forward? And so I, I thought I'd go on and have those lists available in case that's, that's the recommendation that you all would like to present. And God was on that list because I was trying to look to see if God was yeah. one of the ones that we funded. Let me let me pull it back up. Let's see. So for fun, you said for funding. Yeah. 
And it was, what was the agency? It's G-I-D-E. Okay. Um, there it is. So we did, wait a minute. No, I think, I thought I saw it. I'm sure that I see it on oh, this. I didn't, I didn't think these are the ones that we funded. Yeah, it, that's correct. It doesn't appear that guide is in there. Take, take the uh, U out. I don't think it has a U in it. Oh, G I D E. I'm sorry. I misspelled it. So there we go. There you go. It was on the unfunded. Mm, but they weren't near, where are they in the one? I'm asking because I'm aware that they are in dire need of funding. <laughs> That's why I'm asking. Okay. The spirit of full disclosure. And because they're working with children um, in a tutoring thing. So if we, if we approach this through the same lens that we approached the recommendations before, and I, I can't remember what um, average score, you know, where we cut that off. I don't know if it was in that particular category, if it was 14 or there was how we yeah. did that exactly. But that, you know, we sort of went down and, and right. awarded dollars to those that had the highest scores essentially. But I would, one thing I would recommend, and I think you've run into some of this, uh, we need to make sure that the organizations that, um, that we do recommend could take a partial grant yeah, and, and use it because I think that's, that's where we ran into some issues is, you know, they asked for a lot and we gave them in some cases, not as much as they asked. And then, um, I guess maybe if, if they couldn't have used it all, they really didn't have a use for it. And so we just need to be, um, cognizant of that moving forward. Yeah. So are we entertain? I mean, and I know to your very point, Mark, they, they are the ones that absolutely would use anything that we could give them. And I, I was just made aware of this two days ago and I was glad that we were having this meeting. Now I see that they've ranked 10, 10 in the 10th spot in terms of the overall meeting. But they are, I mean, they're looking for any money to keep that program up and running. Ben, can you just help me with my memory? Was This was the process that council wasn't tremendously, overwhelmingly on board with the way we did it. Is that correct? That, that is correct, Brian. I mean, they, they, they expressed some concerns. I, th I think that there were some who had the idea that Bigger money's the bigger people. Fully fund some of them, knowing that, that you know it would be an, a real impactful versus trying to give a little bit to a, a number of them. Our right. one council person wanted five agencies. Let's let's just keep it real. He wanted five, <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, why ask the committee if that's what you want? <laughs> so, well, My well question. I, go ahead. I have go a ahead. question. How much is the total of the outstanding money that? What was what is the total, and then does the allocation need to go back into those categories, or could we give that total amount to like one, one. place, yeah, and make it really impactful for that one, and you know, and then maybe we just assess like the top two that didn't receive it in each category. And Brenda, totally listening to what you're saying, you know, knowing that that agency is really in dire needs, we could also just scratch that too and potentially, you know. So what are the right, yeah, what are the rules and regulations on giving out the rest of that money? And how much is that money right. total? 54,000. The, the total amount's 54,000. And I, I know council reviewed the categories and approved the categories, so I'm not certain if it would have to go back. I would kind of look to Ben for some guidance there. Yeah, my, 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 my thought about this is since this process was more of you all made a recommendation and council ultimately approved the award of the, of the dollars that we probably sh it should be another recommendation from you all. Now, whether whether we take it back to council or not, or just simply some, you know, the, the city manager provides an update to the council on, on issues every week. And sometimes, you know, for, for, items that maybe don't necessarily need to go on the formal committee agenda or council agenda will communicate those items to council through the update. This possibly could be one where 
and, and because the dollar amount is under typically what council really approves, they typically anything that's a hundred thousand or more, they would uh, it would need to go to council for approval, formal approval. In this case, I think if you all came up with a recommendation, I think staff could include an item, a memo, or something in the weekly update to council saying, you know, 50, you know there were there these agencies have declined their cert grant awards. Uh, the CBOC has reviewed, you know, uh, the the remaining unfunded agencies, or, or or just here's your here's your recommendation, and then it'll kind of be, you know, silence will be interpreted as approval. Uh, so we wouldn't necessarily be looking for a vote from them, but uh, but that that's that's certain. I, I think that's one potential path. Ask for forgiveness. <laughs> there you go. Well, but, I think but, I, my thing is just for simplicity's sake. I mean, because there's it's you know it doesn't seem like a lot of money fifty four thousand in the grand scheme of things. It, my my suggestion would be we give it to one one group, but that's just my suggestion. I or recommend it. that it goes. It looks like Tanya wants to jump in here. Sorry, I, um, I have been closely working with this project or on this project. So I have a question for Ben, actually. So this um, grant is for fiscal year 21, 22. So will we be able to extend the time? Because there is not that much time left. If we uh, reprogram the money to other agencies. Yes, I mean, uh, that's a good question, Tanya. And, and the way that we have budgeted those dollars, it, it's actually they're in a fund that rolls over at the end of the fiscal year if it's not spent. So it's not like the money would go away at the end of the fiscal year if we, if we for whatever reason, if we decide to regrant that $54,000 and couldn't do it until after July 1st of next year, that money would not go away. So, but, but each of those, you know, what, what, however those grants are awarded or those dollars are awarded, I mean, that, you know, the time frame would be, would start for those agencies at that point and not okay. the time frame that we're in right now. Thank you. Well, keep in mind, God was not one that turned anything down. We just didn't approve it because they fell where they fell. So. Well, and if, if, I, if I recall correctly, um, from the discussions of allocating funds, I mean, Looking at the funded list, the scores range from 13 to nine, just in the social justice category. Um, and I believe as we got lowered down into the scores, it was more of trying to find folks that could use that smaller amount of funds versus giving 10,000 to an organization that requested 200,000. You're right. Well, Mark, I mean, I guess, I guess the, this committee has got to find the time and to discuss and, and come out how we want to do it. I, my, mission, my initial reaction is I'm with Melissa, try to give it to one person, but I'm, I'm not sitting here today saying I need to give it to someone who didn't get any funding. I, I would be willing to go back and look at, is there someone we, who didn't get their full funding who could benefit dramatically from getting 54 more thousand dollars? I don't think we should give $54,000 to one person. I mean, if there are needs, I mean, I just think that I, I, I'm just trying to hear what council said, Brenda. Yeah, I, I know, but council, again, the needs are there. And I think that um, there are agencies that could use money. I think what we what we probably need to come to a conclusion on first is, do we want to give it all to one organization or do we want to spread it out? And, and my recommendation is that if we did spread it out, we probably should spread it amongst the categories that it remains in. Yes. Um, th that, that would seem like a logical way to do that if we were gonna leave it broken apart. Um, and so maybe maybe the first thing we need to do is, is come to that conclusion and then we can then decide which organization or organizations uh, would receive the $54,000 after we do that. Um, Probably the the easiest thing to do would be to take a a vote on how we wanted how we wanted to allocate it in terms of together or separate. And so, um, Matt, 
maybe maybe just let's just go down the the line and I'll I'll just see what everybody's thought is on this. I think Mike might have dropped off. Um, so Brian, what what is your thought? I'm just going in order of the boxes. Well, I'll be honest with you guys. I mean, it's almost like I, I kind of need to, to look at the chart again and just review who got money, how much did they request. I mean, there may be, I mean, I can I can go either way. I am trying to hear what council said. If I have to decide something today, I would say give it to one one group, but I don't know who that group is, you know, where there may not even be a group, you know, without doing a little bit of review. Okay. Um, let me ask this, uh, Meredith and, and Ben, if if we needed to table this, that's probably the wrong term, postpone this and let everybody have, you know, a little bit of time to review. Here's the list of what we did grant. Here's the list that we didn't grant. And, um, and here's what's available. Could we come back together with a, like a specially called meeting in a couple of weeks and, and make the decision? Do we have time to do that? Yes. We, we could do that. I think we just have to give you know, 48 hours notice, you know, of a special meeting. And I think that what you have in mind, we, we would you know, be able to provide more notice than that. Uh, the, the mayor to send that chart out to us again. Yes, ma'am. Okay. We can spend that spreadsheet because if I believe, if I remember correctly, the, the questions that we asked as part of the application process, one of the questions was, you know, would they accept partial funding? Right. And that might help you all in terms of, uh, you're making a, another recommendation. Can I ask? Well, of course, we did take that into, into account last time when we had granted the stuff. And <laughs> I'm still sitting there. <laughs> Mark, can I ask a question? Does that mean we, for example, are we looking at the existing agency that were funded, or can we introduce a new one like Guy, who I, who, I, think again, as I said, came to the table saying, I'm looking for money. Yeah, I don't. I don't think we're beholden to to the ones we've already um, okay. granted money to. I think I think we would open it back up. Um, what what I would look to maybe have happen, and I'll, I'll try to figure out a good way to to do this ahead of the meeting, is maybe to have each person email me with your thoughts and recommendations, and maybe I can sort of compile them into a document that we can then send out ahead of the the actual time we get back together and have everybody review it. Um, so everybody will sort of have it in one place and that way the meeting probably will be relatively short. Um, yeah. But it'll take a little bit of homework, but I think the meeting will make the meeting a little shorter. Can I say something? Um, ben, are we, like, with these groups that we've given money to, is it running more smoothly than the other grant money that was given? Are you able to get the information from them easily about how they're using the money um, for those that we funded so far? So, Melissa, I'm going, I'm going to uh, defer to Tanya on that. She, she's been really good about okay. uh, reminding the agencies about deadlines and, and, and following up with them when they don't submit. So, Tanya, what's your assessment? Thank you, Ben. Um, yes, we do. We have a pretty strong communication with everyone um, except one agency we have on the list right now. Um, who does not meet our requirements, I guess, or does not meet our schedule. Um, but overall, we don't really have a very strong control factor. So it's really difficult. You know, the agency can um, respond that they helped 10 families, but did they really, or right. what these 10 families grow, who they are, we don't really know. So for right now, we accept this, but I think for the final report, maybe we want them to submit the list um, or come up with a plan for the final report. Maybe have more detailed report than what we have right now. But, did we but overall, it's all on the schedule. Okay. Did we stipulate in the beginning, though, how thorough the information needed to be? For example, like you just said, they may say we helped 10 families, but did it say that they needed to give us more detail? Because part of that is what are we expecting? Well, they did submit the goals and um, um, the contract work was executed based on the performance goals and financial goals. Um, we did not specifically ask to provide the list or the names. So... Mm -hmm. 
that and was some of that's confidential. You know, you have yeah. to get into a fine and, line. And, and I would say that the way we approached, you know, these grants is, is probably more similar to our regular community agency funding process that we go through every year. And so the goals, I mean, we're using the same system that, that we used for, uh, for our regular uh, grantee process. And so, and, and, and really when, when they, when they complete that part of the, uh, of the application is, is really, it's, it's identifying performance measures per se, uh, which, you know, we, we typically don't ask them to, to, to provide a, you know, more detailed documentation behind those numbers. It's understood though, as part of the agreement that if we, if the city feels like we need to come in and do an audit, whether it's of their finances or whatever, that we, we reserve the right to do that. So, uh, uh, but we typically don't go to that, le request that level of detail, even with through our regular process. Right. Well, Tanya and Meredith, if you could definitely flag the people that Tanya's, we don't need to consider those folks again, do we? No. <laughs> I mean, flag it, don't put them on the list, whatever, however you guys feel comfortable doing it, but I don't, we don't need to spend any brain power on somebody who's not doing what we want them to do already by giving them more money. I'll make that note when I send the list out to you all. Thank you. Okay, so why don't we, why don't we make that? I think we need to be sure of, of the programs, the agencies that we're looking at. If we give money to new agencies, we may have to go through the process again with the city council. So we need to stick with the ones that have already, already been approved, I think, rather than going to a new agency. I'm afraid if we go with a new agency, then we, the council is going to there will be more, there will be questions asked that we'll have to go through another process. If we stick with the agencies that have already been approved, and and the money goes out to those agencies, I don't see that the council will have a question about that. Y'all, you see what I'm saying? I do. I don't see that. I for fifty four thousand dollars, I don't know that they that it matters that that they care. I don't know about some of the members of the council. Anyway, uh, well, I would just, I would just say I would just you know, add that if if we decide if management decides that you know you, we'll we will communicate the recommendation of this committee to them via you know, uh, you know the more informal weekly update process or even if it's just a separate communication to them um, you know but not as part of the agenda. Council could come easily come back and say, no, 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 you need to bring it back to, you need to run it back through finance committee or whatever. We want to talk about it, you know, particularly if your recommendation would be to provide funding to a, a new agency, as as Ms. Stevenson, you know, you know noted, and uh, and that's and that's what we'll do. I mean, we'll just be prepared to do that if if they choose to yeah. go that route. Yeah. So it sounds it sounds like maybe the process best process moving forward is Meredith will send out the um, all the documents. You know, here's who we funded, here's who we didn't, here's what's available, and, and any other documents that, that we need to have as part of that look back. Um, if everybody could email their thoughts, and you're you're more than welcome to email it to the whole group. I'm not discouraging you from doing that at all. But if you don't want to, um, let me just pull up my calendar here. Um, I, I just chair, sorry to interrupt, but um, I would say do not email each other all in one email just because that's an open meeting. Right. And that's oh, a, thank you. So I'm glad you're here to keep I'll us straight. If, if you, you, can, you can Unless you blind it. copy everybody. Unless you blind right. copy. You can blind copy everyone. Um, but feel, you can also feel free to send it all to me and I'm happy to compile it. Yeah. But that's yeah, that, that would be that would be great. I was just if you don't mind doing that, I just didn't want to put a burden on you. No problem at all. Um, would it be possible if we got those documents out, you know, sometime this week, um, yes, to to get back with the recommendations to Meredith by the third, which would give us two weeks? I know Thanksgiving's in there, but uh, come back with a recommendation of what you would like to have happen. We could compile it, and then perhaps have a meeting uh, towards the end of the week of the sixth to come to a final resolution. Okay. 
if you like, uh, we can, if you want to, since Wednesday, that's your, that's the day of the week that you typically meet. I mean, if we wanted to go ahead and get on the calendar December 8th, um, for a special meeting, we could, we could do that. Maybe it doesn't have to be Wednesday, but I'm just thinking. Let's keep it consistent. I like Wednesdays. <laughs> yeah. I think, that, I think that would probably make, make sense, Ben. I, I have a, a question of Ben. It's probably not even one that you can answer. I'm going to humor you anyway. But is there any way to vet the council uh, prior to or, or to find out kind of what the thoughts may be with this? I could, I could definitely do that. Brenda, I mean, in fact, that might be a good, a good I first mean, step. I don't know whether to waste our time or just what. I mean, I really think that. Yeah. That I think, I think, I think that's, I think that's a great suggestion. I think that what we'll do, what staff will do, we'll put something in the weekly, the weekly update goes out every Thursday. So we'll put something in the update tomorrow to, to give council an update on the CERC grant process. Uh, and then and, and note in there that we've got over $54,000 in funds that have been declined. And then the staff suggestion will be that we go through the process with you all to get a recommendation to bring back to council. And, and, and we'll wait and see how they respond to that. Uh, again, if, if by the early next week we don't receive any, you know, the city manager or I don't receive any you know, feedback one way or the other, then we'll probably assume that we'll proceed as we, as you all discussed this morning. I think then, I mean, again, you, you know better than I, but I mean, to me, it's kind of like, I wouldn't mind them telling us whether or not they want it allocated to the, the same, going back to the same allocation. You know I mean? That's going to take care of whether it goes to one person or not and whether or not it should stay in the same category. Yeah, that, that's why I think I, I just ask them for any stipulations they have. And then if they come back <laughs> with stipulations later, we're just going to tell them we're not, not accepting them. <laughs> we're, we're trying, we're, hey, we're trying to keep from being browbeat again. So, <laughs> hey, this is a public meeting, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and exactly, I know. And Brenda's just being honest. <laughs> I'm being honest, and I'm choosing the appropriate words. I know it's public. <laughs> We'll, we'll do that. We'll, we'll put something, we'll communicate, uh, and we'll provide an update to council in this week's update and, uh, and, and seek some feedback, some guidance from them about how they want to, uh, how they want the, the uh, $54,000 to be reallocated, right. to, whether they want to go back through you all or they may decide to say, hey, some. Do it themselves. Uh, the chair of the committee say, you know, when they say bring it back to us and let us decide how, how they yeah. work. So, so I think absolutely. that would be an appropriate first step. We may not even need a meeting. Yeah. So we'll, we'll hold off on setting the meeting on the 8th because yeah. even with that process, it may need to get pushed back a week anyway. Right. You know, to like the 15th or something. So we'll hold off on setting the meeting until we, we have those um, conversations. Oh, yeah. And then if we need to, we'll move forward on the other plan based on what they say. Yeah. Great plan. We'll do that. Okay. Thanks. All right. Well, no, no vote needed today then. Um, I think that's the last thing on our agenda. Yes, sir. So is there anything else for the good of the order? Brenda, you got anything? I know you got something. <laughs> <laughs> I wish everyone a very happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> yes. You too to everyone as well. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks. And Meredith, Ben, Tanya, thank you. Scott, oh, thanks for good. being on. Um, you're keeping us straight. It's very helpful. <laughs> and um, you know, I, I think uh, y'all have done a ton of work to help us get to where we are. So we do appreciate that. Absolutely. Great, great meeting. Have a great day, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Bye.